you watch the 77th annual Golden Globes in January? It was a glamorous event where celebrities arrived by private jet and limo, wearing single-use custom dresses and tailored suits. They enjoyed vegan meals to bring awareness to the environmental impact of eating meat, while sipping champagne flown in from France. I was slightly confused watching the contradiction unfold. Little do they know, farmers and ranchers' efforts are leading the way to protect the environment. Agriculture department data shows that over the last 70 years, even though the use of land, fertilizers, chemicals, and energy have remained mostly the same, agriculture output has boosted by about 270%. This means that while farmers and ranchers are boosting their output to feed a projected 9 billion people, they're actually shrinking their carbon footprints. And the cows that are reportedly polluting the earth actually only represent less than 2% of all greenhouse gas emissions. And with that 2%, you have to consider the benefits cows have on the environment, like increasing the soil's capacity to store carbon. Bigger, healthier grass has the capacity to take in more carbon dioxide from the air, which eventually would be put into the soil. The most recent blow to the agriculture industry was Starbucks' announcement that they were moving towards a more environmentally friendly menu by using alternative milks. But plant-based milks come with their own environmental concerns. Recent studies have shown that soybean farms are taking over Brazil's forests at a rapid rate, and almond farming methods are contributing to the loss of bee populations. Plant-based products like almond, soybean, and cashew come from places like Spain, Ukraine, Canada, and Nigeria. So to get to the United States where they're consumed, they have to be shipped on boats, planes, and trains that are putting off lots of greenhouse gas emissions. Plant-based products are a great alternative for you if you're lactose intolerant or just simply don't enjoy the taste of cow's milk. But the reality is that cow's milk is one of the most locally sourced ingredients found almost anywhere you go. There's a dairy farm in every single state, so cow's milk does not have to be shipped far. Kirsa Hardin, a spokesperson from Dairy Management Incorporated, said it best. From an environmental and nutritional standpoint, it's not an either or. Both plants and animals play a critical role and helping to feed everything in the environment. Farmers are frugal by nature. They have to be to stay in business. Imagine a giant composter that takes methane emitting waste and turns it into green energy. I don't have to imagine it. I live right next to one. Three Mile Canyon Farms, Oregon's largest dairy outside of Boardman, built their own methane digester in 2012 that takes in 80% of the dairy's waste and puts off as much energy as three wind turbines. I was able to speak to Jeff Wendler, Livestock Operations Manager, and Tom Chavez, Waste Management Supervisor, about the process. They explained that they're actually building a second digester right now. Three Mile Canyon Farms is one of the only dairies in Oregon that has their own methane digester on site that takes the waste straight from the source. This is an excellent way for them to shrink their carbon footprints in many more ways than one. Not only are they removing methane from the environment, but by having the digester on site, they don't have to truck the waste to the digester, which would end up putting off even more greenhouse gas emissions. Dr. Windler also stated that local community groups and schools tour the facility all the time, and they're always looking for new ways to teach people about this environment-saving accomplishment. However, environmental conservation, moderation, and preservation are not always a large-scale effort. The use of no-till drills, cover crops, infrared technology, and participation in conservation programs are standard procedure in my county and on farms big and small. I rode with my dad on tractors and sprayers with GPS technology, an advancement that has completely changed agriculture practices today. Before the use of GPS technology, farmers and ranchers were dealing with large skips throughout the field and large swaths of the field that were sprayed over two or maybe even three times. When my grandpa was a young farmer, he used toilet paper streamers in the field as sprayer marks. You can imagine how precise that was. Technological advances save time, money, and most importantly, they protect the environment. We all need to be conscious of how we affect the environment. Agriculturists continue to play a critical role in helping the world prepare for and prevent climate change by promoting soil health, conserving water, using nutrients more efficiently, and continuing technological advances. It's a team effort and one that can only be successful if we can all work together. Thank you. I have Anna Howard from Rogue River with her speech titled, When Fish Fly. 
It's a brisk autumn morning. The sun is shining, birds are tripping, and fish are flying through the air. Wait a minute. Flying fish? What is going on? The salmon cannon is not a joke. It is potentially a solution to a problem facing the Pacific Northwest and has been successful in safely transporting salmon over dams. Woosh Innovation Salmon Cannon promises healthier habitat to fish, more water available for agriculture, recreation, and interest groups. Plus, it will save taxpayers millions over other methods. The Salmon Cannon is a pressurized tube designed to transport salmon over, through, or around dams. It is an alternative to fish ladders and other more expensive ways of transportation like helicopters and trucks. For many years, the effectiveness of fish ladders has been in question and deemed a failure by the scientific community. One study conducted in 2011 found that only 3% of fish were actually able to traverse the dams using the fish ladders. Seeking better alternatives, Fish and Wildlife officials even turned to airlifting salmon over dams by helicopter in giant buckets or nets. Woosh Innovation set out to build a better alternative when they designed this system. When a fish swims into the cannon on the downriver side, it enters into a tube not much bigger around than the fish. A stream of pressurized water helps propel the fish through the tube and over the dam to the upriver side. The creator, is Vincent Wright III, who founded and is CEO of Woosh Innovations. The idea for the salmon cannon came when Mr. Bryan was working on a prototype of a mechanical apple harvester that uses changing pressures in various tubes to pluck the apples from the trees. As he worked one fall day in an apple orchard in Washington, a helicopter flew over carrying fish. And that began the wheels of innovation turning in his mind. He created a new way to transport salmon over dams while creating less stress, restoring salmon runs, and eliminating predators. Dams can block migration for salmon heading to spawning grounds, but this invention transports live fish over the dam into the upper river side in order to significantly cut down their travel time. Dams are one of the largest obstacles or problems that get in the way of the salmon run. Even when a fish reaches the other side of the dam using the fish ladders, they have used so much energy, it is a struggle to survive the conditions they enter into. According to a 2016 study performed by Syntef, the Woosh Innovation Salmon Cannon does not impose any stress, behavior, or welfare concerns on the fish. In fact, it saves the salmon so much energy, they are more likely to survive the long swim back to their spawning grounds. Salmon predators have a substantial impact on the population and success of a salmon run. According to U.S. Fish and Wildlife, dams change the character of rivers, creating slow-moving, warm pools of water that are ideal for salmon predators. Removal of any of the 84,000 dams in the United States would reduce that risk. However, doing so would cripple hydroelectric energy production and agriculture. The Snake River Dam system has been proposed for removal, even though it is the most efficient way of transporting wheat from the region and generating power. One study found the removal of the four lower dams on the Snake River would cost the region $76 million per year, not counting the cost to remove it. The salmon cannon is currently the most effective, cheapest, and safest way to transport salmon over dams. Whoosh systems cost 60 to 80% less than other methods, while hundreds of millions of dollars are being spent on inferior methods and take years to complete. The salmon cannon costs just two to four million dollars, can be installed in just months, and is highly effective. Fish ladders cost three to four million dollars and are proving to be less compelling. Dam removal can cost millions of dollars and have negative outcomes that affect the lives of many. The salmon cannon just might be the solution to conserve water. Less water being used for fish ladders, 
means more water to irrigate crops, higher lake levels for recreation, and more options to control the overall flow of the river. Whoosh Innovations has been testing and further developing the Salmon Canyon for more than nine years. So far, the results have pointed towards a positive impact on fish populations and watershed. It has been frustrating for the agriculture industry to endure the endless cries for dam removal, knowing that while it is good for the fish, it will have a negative impact on agriculture. The Salmon Cannon just might be the answer to keep dams in place and rebuild fish populations. Thank you. Allison Steyerwalt from Imbler, and her speech title is The Future of Women in Rodeo, Women's Ag Impact on Agriculture. Growing up, my dad roped every day and competed in rodeos. Today, he still loves to team rope. My parents had three kids, all of which were girls. But ever since we were little, my dad had us learning to ride and rope. Team roping is not traditionally a girl sport. In 2019, women celebrated 50 years of membership in the FFA. Women have been making huge advancements in agriculture, and one that not everyone relates to agriculture is the rise of women in rodeo. To understand the importance of women in rodeo, you must know the history of women in rodeo, the future of women in rodeo, and some of the top women in rodeo, as well as their contributions. Although I'm a girl, my dad has never questioned my ability to rope. Instead, he has taught me that the more I practice, the more successful I'll become. I can learn lessons like these, not only from my father's example, but also from the pioneers of women in agriculture. The history of women in rodeo began in the early 1900s. It started out as women hosting Wild West shows where they would display their riding and shooting skills. In 1904, at the Cheyenne Frontier Days, Bertha Blanchett was the first woman to ride a bronc in rodeo. Rodeo producers saw this as a chance to draw bigger crowds by allowing the women's involvement in rodeo. In 1904, the, in 1929 though, Bonnie McCarroll died after being thrown from a bronc at the Pendleton Roundup. This fatal accident changed women's involvement in rodeo. People no longer supported women doing events that they now thought were only meant for the men. The women were then represented at rodeos by being rodeo queens, which they competed in pageants and horsemanship contests in order to obtain this title. In 1936, though, the women came together and formed the WPRA, Women's Professional Rodeo Association. In 1948, the WPRA signed an agreement with the PRCA. PRCA stands for Pro Rodeo Cowboys Association. This agreement allowed women's events to be held at PRCA rodeos. In these PRCA rodeos, barrel racing became very popular and eventually the only event for women. The WPRA allowed women to compete once again. As I continue to improve as a roper, I think what does the future look like for women in rodeo? In 2019, a huge advancement was made when the American, a large pro rodeo in Texas, allowed the female event breakaway roping for the first time. Many other rodeos have started to follow in pursuit, such as the Cheyenne Frontier Days and 30% of the rodeos put on by the Columbia River Circuit. PRCA rodeos are adding this event because of the interest and involvement in high school and college rodeo. There's a huge push to continue getting PRCA rodeos to add this event because so many people are involved in it as well as enjoy watching it. Another event that women are doing is Rough Stop. It was one of the first events a woman ever did in rodeo and since then has not been brought back successfully. But in 2016, the Texas Bronc Riders Association allowed women to enter a bronc contest. This resulted with many entries which made the president, Daryl McElroy, decide to start a ladies bronc riding tour. These women could not ride in any PRCA sanctioned rodeos, but they could compete in their own circuit. In the years to come, I think more and more women will be entering events other than just girls. Lastly, who are some top women in rodeo and what are the contributions? 
Larry the guy from Texas is a strong competitor as well as an inspiration. She grew up doing barrels like her mother, but in high school, she chose to rope because that's what she loved. Today, she's known for her team roping, breakaway roping, and amazing horsemanship skills. She trains horses as well as travels around the world, putting on clinics to improve people of all ages roping skills. Young girls look up to her because she strives to be an inspiration. And Amberly Snyder, yet another example, grew up in a family not really involved in rodeo, but rodeo was Amberly's passion, so she fully committed. Amber Lee had many successes, not only in the arena, but also in FFA. In 2010, Amber Lee was elected Utah's FFA state president. One day, she was in a life-altering car wreck that ended in her being paralyzed from the waist down. This not only affected her mentally, but also physically, because she was now relying on a wheelchair. But this calamity did not stop her. Her passion for rodeo got her back in the saddle. Today, Amber Lee is competing once again in parole rodeos, as well as traveling with her story. She speaks at schools, conventions, fundraisers, and as well as the Oregon 2019 FFA State Convention. Amber Lee has truly shown us all that we can do anything we want to. Women like these play a huge role in shaping our younger generations who will be representing agriculture in the future. In conclusion, women have been making many advancements in agriculture. This is especially intriguing for women in rodeo. Women have been working so hard and are ready to show off their skills. Rodeo is a fun event for people to watch, a sport, a community, and a lifestyle. The history of women in rodeo, the future of women in rodeo, and some of the top women in rodeo and their contributions educate and excite us for what's to come. Not only will these women be making accomplishments of their own in the arena, they're securing these opportunities for young girls in the future. Thank you. And we have Dreesen Freshweiler, I always say it wrong, apologize, um, with her speech called Let's Scrape Scrapies. Imagine you're eating a delicious hamburger. It's juicy and warm with your favorite sauce, cheese, and fixings. Later, you hear about a case of bovine spongiform encephalopathy, better known as mad cow disease. You become worried, what if that delicious hamburger has just infected you? Most people have heard of mad cow disease, a zoonotic disease that affects the central nervous system of cattle it can be transmitted to humans through contaminated feet. Now, have you ever heard of scrapey? Scrapey is a fatal disease affecting the central nervous system of sheep. It's such a concern to U.S. sheep production that every sheep in America must have an approved scrapey identification ear tag, specific to the farm where it was born. Scrapey has no cure or preventative vaccine. And once an animal has it, death is inevitable. Scrapey gets its name from the scratching or scraping that can be seen in infected sheep. Early signs include head tremors, scratching of the head, uncoordinated walking or hopping instead of walking. The brain and nervous system are not able to properly transmit signals back and forth, causing the sheep to have locomotive issues and being able to stand. Since 2001, all sheep in America have been required by the United States Department of Agriculture, USDA, to have an approved scrapey tag as part of the National Scrapey Eradication Program. The tag must have the producer's premises ID number, which is specific to that producer. Scrapey tags are illegal to remove, and to remind producers or current owners of that fact, the tags specifically say, unlawful to remove on them. Producers can order ear tags from the USDA, they just have to pay for them. When first time producers register a premises ID number, they will receive 100 free metal ear tags. In addition to ear tagging, producers must keep all sheep transportation and ownership transfer records. Record keeping is essential and allows officials to track animals if scrapey appears. Records are important because scrapey has an incubation period 
of a year or more. Infected sheep won't show any symptoms until they're about two years old. On average, the animals are three or four before they show symptoms. After symptoms are observed, the sheep can live between one and six months. The Animal and Plant Health Inspection Services, APHIS officials, need to know who has sheep that could be infected. Without ear tags or records to determine origin, the officials wouldn't be able to track and locate potentially infected animals. Scrapey is a problem because there's no cure or treatment. Scrapey is ultimately fatal to the animal, making it difficult to maintain a profitable sheep operation. While it hasn't been found or proven to affect humans like mad cow disease, scrapey is a transmissible spongiform encephalopathy, PSE. Bovine spongiform encephalopathy, mad cow disease, is also a PSE and is transmissible to humans. Both scrapey and mad cow disease are prions, a class of abnormal proteins that can live in the ground. Scrapey can be contracted from pastures that graze infected animals and can wipe out entire flocks of sheep. The prion protein responsible for the deterioration of the brain and nervous system is usually passed from an infected ewe to her lamb. It can also be passed on from the placenta of an infected ewe to adult animals that come in contact with it. Since scrapey is a prion, it can infect other sheep even if infected animals are not present or haven't been present for several years. Sheep that are exposed can be potential sources of exposure to other sheep. The best and really the only way to prevent scrapey is through selective breeding choices. It's been found that there are genetic differences in sheep DNA where scrapey susceptibility can be identified. There are gene tests available to producers to check the susceptibility to scrapie in individual sheep. This is helpful when selecting breeding animals. Tests are commonly done through blood samples. The producer can order blood sample cards from the USDA or APHIS approved laboratories that offer gene testing. There are also tests for animals showing symptoms. These require third eyelid or rectal tissue samples. But the most accurate test is fatal, as it requires a brain tissue sample. Obviously, bad for the sheep. If tests come back scrapey positive, the whole flock is destroyed to prevent further exposure. Once the infected flock is terminated, the producer may still have a difficult time keeping animals from getting scrapey due to the scrapey prions being able to live in the soil. Finally, scrapey is still being studied. But the goal is to have the U.S. join Australia and New Zealand in being scrapey free. To eradicate scrapey completely, producers are encouraged to register for a premises ID, keep records, and make selective breeding choices. While scrapey isn't exactly mad cow disease, it has its similarities, which is why it should be eradicated from food production animals. So next time, you're enjoying that juicy hamburger or lamburger. Rest assured, it's food safe. We have Mia Garcia from Dayton with her, her speech titled, The Amazing Cure for the Dropout Rate in Oregon. Okay. If I told you I had a vaccine or a pill that would help high school students have a 15% better chance of graduating, would you want it? What if I had an amazing program that students could be involved in that would also help them graduate in four years. Would you want them to be involved in that program? Well, I bring you good news. You don't have to take a vaccine or a pill. All you have to do is enroll students in a career and technical education program in their local high school. College and career readiness requires both knowledge as well as skills. CTE not only teaches skills for specific career fields, it also teaches skills for life. What are the benefits of CTE, you ask? Well, students who take these classes are more likely to graduate, develop employability skills, and achieve in other subjects. A recent study in Wisconsin showed 
64.3% of students in grades 6 through 12 participated in these programs. The graduation rate for those students was 13.9% higher than students who do not take the course. And this rate has been growing over the last five years. In Oregon, students enrolled in a CTE program are 15.5 percentage points more, li more likely to graduate from high school in four years than students who do not take the course. This is according to data from the Oregon Department of Education. Additionally, students of all races and ethnicities who are enrolled in such programs graduate at higher levels than the statewide average of 74%. ODE data shows. In the Portland Public School District, the overall graduation rate during the 2013-14 school year was 72%. However, among students who completed at least two CTE classes, it was 91%. In the Springfield School District, career and technical education students are 21 percentage points more likely to graduate in four years than students who do not take the course, 20% more likely in the Bethel District, and 10% more likely in the Eugene District, according to the ODE. When a student becomes involved in a CTE program, they're significantly more likely than their non-CTE counterparts to develop skills in problem solving, project completion, research, math, work-related communication, time management, and critical thinking. All these skills are amazing traits that potential employers find very appealing on an application. Students at schools with highly integrated, rigorous academic and CTE programs have significantly higher achievements in reading, mathematics, and even science than those who attend schools with less integrated programs. So as you can see, students with CTE programs available in their schools are more likely to graduate, develop employability skills, and achieve in other subjects outside of CTE. Chris McGowan, who's in his second year teaching at Willamette, said the discovery aspect of career and technical education has a real world value. Part of the reason classes like these are so valuable is because they're hands-on and there's a lot of self-learning, he said. I want them to discover things themselves and develop their own tests. If they can gain experience to help something on their own, they're going to be so much better off. Businesses want people who don't have to be told to do every little thing. They want people who are self-motivating, and this class teaches those soft skills. Everyone in Oregon seems to be looking for a miracle drug or a new pill that will help solve the problem of low graduation rates and high dropout rates. But the answer is simple and already exists in many of our schools in Oregon. The answer is career and technical education. Thank you. This is Emma Richards from Culver with her speech titled, Did You Know? Did you know that red meat could kill you? Or that hamburger meat is created in the back of a grocery store? And did you know that chocolate milk comes from brown cows? As agriculturalists, these ideas seem far-fetched, comedial. But there are millions of consumers who don't realize these so-called facts are simply the products of fake internet news that preys upon the ag illiteracy of the average American. It's time that we set the facts straight. 40% of California elementary school students didn't know that hamburger meat comes from beef. Thousands of people believe that by eating red meat, you're all but guaranteed to get heart disease. And at least 16.4 million milk drinking Americans believe that chocolate milk comes from brown cows. Undoubtedly, this is a significant issue, one that stems from a lack of ag literacy, a term used to explain the average consumer's understanding of the agricultural practices that take place in food and resource production. As defined by the American Farm Bureau, ag literacy in its most basic sense 
It means knowing where your food comes from, as well as what happens to it before it makes its way to you. Today, the majority of Americans are agriculturally illiterate on account of demographic changes, a negative public perception of agriculture, and social media. As America industrializes, its population becomes more and more urban. In 2010, 79% of Americans lived in urban areas. And currently, 89% of people have jobs with little to no relationship to agriculture. As these numbers increase, so does the disconnect between producers and those who depend on them. This lack of ag literacy also plays a role in the public's negative perception of agriculture. While the general uninformed public has a positive perception of what they believe to be farming, these very same people have an extremely negative perception of the majority of agricultural practices. Without real, reliable facts, it comes as no surprise that numerous people see modern agriculture as an unnecessary science experiment, rather than the necessity that it is. Social media is the main culprit here because of the sheer amount of unvetted information that goes onto the internet. Today, one third of Americans say that they're getting the majority of their information from social media. This implies that one third of Americans are basing their thoughts, their opinions upon unfiltered or reviewed information. While social media has many benefits, and there are informative sources out there, social media has become an easily accessible platform for the uninformed activist to voice his or her opinion. This lack of ag literacy has a multitudinous number of adverse effects on the agriculture of today. The farmers and ranchers who work so hard to provide for the people of America often find themselves struggling to carry out what should be basic daily tasks. One example of this is that California was the first state to enact legislation that regulates cattle emissions. Oregon hopes to be next by implementing Senate Bill 197. These regulations are often overly restrictive and are completely unnecessary. People believe that cattle emissions are one of the number one causes of global warming and that they can be truly dangerous and cause memory loss and even death. But what people don't know is that while cattle do emit methane 142.5 metric tons each year, this number is minuscule compared to the whopping 1.3 billion metric tons of greenhouse gas emitted by passenger vehicles annually. To put this into perspective, the carbon dioxide emitted by a single car is 100 times more potent than the methane emitted by 3,000 cattle. Not to mention the fact that cattle account for some of the top commodities in both California and Oregon. And by implementing these new regulations, Cattle operations would not be able to maintain the same size and therefore economic value that they've had in the past. We must improve the ag literacy of the average American consumer, not only to diminish the issues that farmers, ranchers, and agriculturalists face, but to ensure that every American knows that steak you had for dinner last night is not going to give you a heart attack. Hamburger meat and beef are one in the same, and chocolate milk absolutely does not come from brown cows. Thank you. Um, our seventh speaker is Addie Whitcliffe from Sandy Am Christian with her topic, Hemp, the Gold Rush in Oregon. <clears throat> 
since hemp was legalized in the 2018 Farm Bill, the floodgates have opened for farms large and small to capitalize on this booming new industry. Oregon now has more acreage in hemp than acreage devoted to potatoes and onions combined. Only Colorado, with 86,234 acres, grows more hemp in the U.S. Many farmers across Oregon have jumped on board the hemp band wagon, intrigued by the crop's enormous potential payoff. Experts predict this newly legal crop could generate a $1 billion farm gate value this year. That would make it the state's most valuable agricultural commodity, ahead of powerhouse nursery, hay, and cattle industries. As of October 2019, the Oregon Department of Agriculture had licensed 1,940 growers and just over 63,000 acres, a 473% increase over 2018. But just as everything that appears too good to be true, there are certainly a number of challenges that hemp growers face. Today, I am going to detail a necessary regulatory program called Penny and explain the importance of this program in Oregon agriculture moving forward. For those less familiar, industrial hemp is cannabis cultivated to produce fiber, grain, or non-intoxicating medical compounds such as cannabis oil or CBD. As defined by law, industrial hemp contains less than 0.3% THC, the psychoactive component in marijuana. In fact, the primary difference between hemp and marijuana is this legal THC threshold. Yet as members of the same species, these two crops hold more in common than not, including the vexing ability to crossbreed. Hemp has separate male and female plants. Male plants grow flowers that produce up to 35,000 pollen grains, making pollen a major issue. To counteract this, Oregon is considering a pinning system for hemp. A pinning system is a way of marking every field so that every farmer knows exactly what is grown in that field. Research conducted in the Midwest proved that cannabinoid pollen accounted for 36% of all pollen in the air during the month of August. Studies show that to effectively protect fields from cross-pollination, a 10-mile distance barrier is necessary, depending on topography and weather. A study from Yushishima found that maize pollen drift was greatly reduced by simply adding dense trees as a wind blocker, reducing the travel of pollen up to 60%. Since industrial hemp is such a new product on the market, research is still developing. However, current pending systems for canola, turnip, and other vegetable seed crops in Oregon have proven to be very effective. For marijuana and hemp growers, cross-pollination has the potential to cause major problems. In marijuana, cross-pollination directly affects the levels of THC. In industrial hemp, it affects the levels of CBD. The accidental cross-pollination from one male plant could cost another farmer thousands of dollars in crop damage and loss. Many farmers will turn to lawsuits if cross-pollination occurs, as it can be considered negligence, nuisance, and trespassing. It is estimated cross-pollination already affects 8% of all marijuana and hemp crops grown in Oregon. A pinning system would greatly reduce this problem and ensure that farmers have an adequate barrier zone in place to protect their crops. 
there is no denying that both industrial hemp and marijuana production in Oregon are here to stay. Industrial hemp and marijuana work people must work together to ensure a bright future. With a close monitoring system in place like pinning, we can ensure that farmers on both sides of the fence are protected. In addition, Oregon can move forward as leaders in American agriculture with valid regulations to lead the country and even the world in modern agricultural achievements. E.M. Tiffany said it best in the FFA creed we all know and love. Achievements won by the present and past generations of agriculturists. This is just one more way we can demonstrate those famous words once again. Thank you. Um, in sophomore public speaking is Joel Newman from Bend. Um, his topic and his speech title is Farmer's Market, a bridge, a bridge or a stepping stone. Thank you. In downtown Redmond, there's a small clearing of grass. At first glance, unremarkable may be the description that comes to mind. What you certainly won't think is there is a plot of land representing and advocating for agriculture. I have visited this particular plot of land on many summer days and purchased locally roasted coffee beans, sampled delicious cherry tomatoes, and interacted with Central Oregon's farming community. For once a week, this unremarkable clearing of grass is transformed into a bustling farmer's market. As I walked around the booths, I realized something. There were just as many sneaker and sweatpant clad urbanites walking about as there were wrangler wrapped soil denim farmers. I realized the people talking and laughing together were those that may never ordinarily interact. And all it took was a sunny day, a small clearing of grass and a little farmer's market to bring it all together. But a second thought was quick to follow the first. If the only exposure people are getting of the agrarian life is the hobby farmer with his booth of turnips, is the average urbanite truly becoming educated on American agriculture? There is a disconnect between the American people, a divide between our country's two major ways of life. It has been named the urban rural divide. The urban rural divide is a highly politicized problem affecting communities all over the country, and it's been a core problem in American history. In the past decade, agriculturalists and urbanites alike have awoken to the dilemma the urban rural divide poses to our country. One solution has risen above the rest. The American farmer's market has been praised as the bridge over the void of the urban rural divide. A place encouraging interaction between the two groups, presenting aspects of their customs in an engaging, beneficial light. Booths sell fresh, local commodities, and consumers get to feel good about their purchases, thinking they are supporting local agriculture and sustainable produce. On the surface, all is well. Exposure for agriculture, feel good for the public. What most would never realize is that inadvertently or not, the claims of the farmer's market system are deceptive and misrepresented. The first problem can be found within the market's first claim, local produce. According to Debbie Weingarten of the Week, quote, when an entrepreneur decides to open a local market without first considering whether the region has enough vendors able to support such a venture, the result is a scramble to fill the marketplace with food that can pass for local, end quote. Supply and demand is an age-old difficulty that affects every profitable endeavor. But unlike other businesses, the mass appeal of the farmer's market is its local produce. When demand overwhelms supply, the markets are required to search for produce out of county or state, and the consumer is often never the wiser, because local is never defined. You see, a consumer's very brain is hardwired to respond positively to words like local, this being the product of 21st century marketing techniques and the side effect of current labeling fraudulence. So farmers' markets are disservicing their customers by failing to clarify local, especially since it's working to their advantage. Unintentionally or not, they are deceiving urban consumers and failing to enlighten them. Isn't that the opposite of what we're attempting to accomplish? Another word utilized at the farmer's market scene is sustainable. Dictionary.com defines sustainable agriculture as, quote, any of a number of environmentally friendly farming methods which preserves an ecological balance by avoiding the depletion of natural resources, end quote. A common misconception exists surrounding sustainable agriculture. Agriculture that preserves the environment through responsible farming. To an average urbanite, that may sound a whole lot like a more familiar phrase, organic. When the unknowing public sees sustainable printed on the banners and pamphlets at their local farmer's market, they reflexively link it to terms already within their vocabulary, such as organic and natural. 
As agriculturalists, we know organic farming and sustainable farming aren't the same thing at all. But nothing is in place to clarify this complicated concept of agriculture for the public. Farmers markets could be the place for such enlightenment, but little effort is being made. And so this divide of knowledge and awareness spreads ever wider. All of this coexists to detriment the agricultural community more than we realize. Already, public misconception regarding things like GMOs and pesticides is raising problems all over. What would happen if legislative action were taken that limited the farming rights of high-end agriculturalists, those who put to use GMOs or pesticides? Would rural communities be the only to rise against the threat to agriculture, simply because the rest of the population was ill-informed? When it comes to the bridge over the divide, an opportunity is being missed. I got to catch up with Emma Rooker, a former farmer's market employee and fellow agriculturalist. She outlined that a major problem affecting her farmer's market was the lack of effort made toward ag literacy. She said, quote, I came to the job hoping to educate people on ag, and while I tried to pursue that for myself personally, I wish the market would have done a better job, end quote. Through my interview with Ms. Rooker, an overarching relevation became clear. This system that's in place is inherently organic, small-scale oriented. And the bridge over the divide, the place we've entrusted to educate urban communities on our livelihood, is failing to represent agriculture in one key way. By leaving large corporation farming, the farming that feeds the world, unrepresented. If only because of this fact alone, the bridge isn't so complete. All that being said, is the American farmer's market completely void of value? Well, the picture I painted at the start of the speech still stands true. Farmers markets are connecting sneakers and sweatpants to denim and Wrangler, urban to rural, in a simple base level way. But I do hesitate to label this system a true bridge over the urban rural divide. A bridge is complete and stable, and were this system a true bridge, we wouldn't still be seeing effects of the chasm. With this in mind, I propose a different analogy. Instead of a bridge, let the farmers markets be seen as stepping stones in the right direction. Connecting people begins with an incentive which we more than have, and all it may take are improvements upon the current system, the removal of its misconceptions, or more attention paid to other divide-bridging ideas, all stones lining the path to truly connect urban and rural communities for good. And there's good news. We aren't as far as we might think. As Wendell Berry once said, if you eat, you're involved in agriculture. Thank you.